Excellent. We're ready to go. So, hi everybody. Thank you for the lovely intro. That was really nice. Um, and happy pie day to everybody. I hope you've all eaten a lot of pie. Um, it's really lovely to meet you all. Um, as we've said, I'm Jo. I'm a web developer advocate for Samsung Internet. Um, you can find me on Twitter at this is Joe Frank, and I also write on Medium. If you're interested, I'm at Joe Frank on Medium. Um, if you don't know what a web developer advocate is, well, um, me and my team speak at a lot of events. We run events to support web communities. We would really love to hear from any of you. Um, we make a lot of demos and blog posts to explain new APIs and new web technologies. And we really love it when people are excited about the Samsung Internet Browser. Um, stupidly, I forgot to bring any stickers with me. I know, I'm sorry. Um, for those of you who've not heard of Samsung Internet, well, it's a web browser for your Android phone. So anyone on Android 5 Plus can download it from the Play Store. We're really keen on privacy and security. We've got tracking and ad blockers built in if you want to use them. We've also got a VR version of the browser for the Gear VR. If you're interested in VR, come talk to me after because we would really love to hear about your projects. Uh, we're the third most popular mobile browser. So if you're not testing on Samsung Internet, you should really consider it. Um, and since I forgot to bring stickers, I will send anybody Samsung Internet socks, who comes up to me afterwards <laughs> and tells me that they're testing in Samsung Internet. <laughs> anyway, we're not here to talk about Samsung Internet, we're here to talk about Intersection Observer. So let's think about why we might need or want this new API. So first of all, let's talk about some common problems that we have as web developers. Often we work with sites that have a large number of images and these can really slow our loading time, uh, especially if they've not been optimised. You might want to use maybe infinite scrolling. You've probably seen that on Twitter or on e-commerce sites. If you've got ads on your web page, the Interactive Advertising Bureau has a policy that your ads must be at least 50% visible for more than a continuous second. And the way that a lot of people do this is they have something called a page impression script, which is used to calculate how long the ad is showing for and at what scroll points. And these can be really huge scripts and can absolutely ruin your download size. Um, maybe you're triggering an animation or a call to action at a certain point that the user has scrolled to. Uh, you're doing this by calculating the position of the scroll and whether or not an element is in view and this is very process intensive. You can hook up to the scroll event or you can use a periodic timer and track uh, your get bounding client rect on the element, but it's really slow and it's gonna force the browser to really lay out the entire page every time you use get bounding client rect, which is gonna make your page really janky. So, I mean, it's not that unusual. Consider a web page that's got infinite scrolling, it's got maybe your third party library to manage your advertisements. You've got some animated graphics here or there and you're using another library that's maybe drawing notification boxes. And each of these have their own intersection detection routines running and they're running on the main thread. And your user is gonna get a really slow experience. They're gonna be frustrated with your website, they're gonna be frustrated with the browser and they're gonna get frustrated with their computer. They're not gonna be thinking very great things about your brand. So what do we end up with? We end up with a horrible, sluggish, janky interaction. We end up with large download sizes, which is particularly frustrating for your users who are paying a lot for their data. And what do we want? We don't want to have to do too much work on the main thread. We don't want to have to poll constantly and therefore use processor power to calculate when an element is in view or not. And we don't want to have to use third party libraries. We want to be able to know what all the code in our site is doing. I mean, how many of you have used libraries or third party scripts that you have no idea what they're doing or how they work? And if they break, how to fix them? You don't know whether the, the developer who wrote them is using the optimal techniques. You want to 
being able to understand all the code that's running on your site. And you only want to use as many third-party scripts as is absolutely necessary. So what can we use? The Intersection Observer API, which is a new API that lets us check whether or not an element is visible within the viewport or any other scrollable parent element. So if we look at what the spec says, the Intersection Observer API provides a way to asynchronously observe changes in the intersection of a target element with an ancestor element or with the top-level documents viewport. Sounds like what we want. So what it allows you to do is you can configure a callback that is called whenever the target element, which is the one that you're observing, intersects with either the device's viewport or a specified ancestor element. So for the purpose of this API, this element that is the container is called the root element or the root, and typically that's going to be the document viewport. And whether or not you're using the viewport or some other element as the root, the API works in exactly the same way. So what it's going to do is it's going to execute a callback function that you're going to provide whenever your target element crossifies a crossifies? crosses a specified amount of intersection within that route. And the, de the degree of intersection between the target element and the, and the route is called the intersection ratio, and that's given in a value between 0 and 1. So I've got a visual representation of that. Here, where's my mouse? So here's our little blue box. And if I scroll, scroll. We scroll, you can see that number is changing and it changes as we go in both directions. You zoom in a bit. <laughs> yes. Ah. <coughs> and that would work that way as well, but I'm not going to resize for fear of losing it. <laughs> okay. So, why might we want to use this? Um, one of the things that I've used it for is for lazy loading images. So I'm sure a lot of you have worked on websites that have a lot of images on the first page. And maybe you didn't manage those images yourself, maybe they were managed by other people who were uploading these images, and maybe these people who were uploading these images didn't know anything about image optimization or sensible image sizes for the web, and maybe they uploaded over 50 images that were 3,000 pixels wide, <laughs> and you had to wait literal seconds for your web page to even start thinking about loading or maybe the content's going to jump about as the images are loading in your page. So I used to work, uh, before I was at Samsung, I used to work at Ticketmaster, and I worked on the Live Nation website. And this is what that looks like. There we go. And as you can see, there's an awful lot of images on this page. And the way that it was at the time, these tiny images were occasionally uploaded by our content managers at 3,000 pixels wide. <laughs> and this page used to take a very long time to load. Um, and for our user, I mean, you can see the page is loaded here. We've got four images that the user can actually see. And if we, you know, my right click is just not having it today. If we take it down to mobile size, I mean, they've, they've got one and a half images there. They certainly don't need all 50 of them loaded. So we, what we want to be able to do is only show the user, only load the images that the user's going to see and hope that they load fast enough that they want to then scroll at the point at which they're scrolling, that's when we'll consider loading the rest of the images. This is called lazy loading, and it's what we decided to implement at Live Nation. 
there's a blog post about um, how we did it there, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that here too. So let's take a look at the code. So Intersection Observer um, is, you create it by calling its constructor and passing it a reference to your callback function. Callback function. Which will be run whenever the threshold is crossed in one direction or the other. So a threshold of one means that 100% of the target is going to be visible before your callback is invoked. And a threshold of zero means that when even one pixel shows, that's when your callback is going to be called. And we've also got this options object, which we can pass to Intersection Observer to let you control the circumstances under which your callback is going to be invoked. And it has the following fields. So we've got the root, we talked about that earlier, that's the element that's used as the viewport for checking the visibility of the target. It has to be an ancestor of the target, so the target has to be inside of it. And it will default to the browser viewport if you don't specify anything. So just to visually represent that, this is our root element, this is our target element, and our root element is scrollable. So next up in our options object, we've got the root margin, which is the margin around the root, uh, which essentially allows you to either grow or shrink the area that you're using for measuring your intersections. And it takes values that are similar to a CSS margin, so you can give it one, two, three, or four. Um, and it can have pixels. If you've specified the root, it can have percentages, and the values can be positive or negative. So let's take a look at what that would look like. So there we go, there's our root, there's the white box, our root margin, this is if we specified a positive root margin, then our intersection would trigger when our element crosses that margin. If we had negative margin, it would be inside the space and our callback wouldn't trigger until we crossed this, the margin and not the edge of the root element. And then the final piece of our options object is the threshold, which indicates at what percentage of visibility we want the callback to be executed at. So if you want to detect visibility when it passes the 50% mark, you would use a value of 0.5. If you want it to trigger multiple times, then you can give this an array. So maybe if we wanted it to trigger every 25%, we could give it an array of 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 1 and it'll trigger every time that happens. Let's just visually represent this again. So say we set it to 0.5. We scroll, we scroll, it gets half into view. Our callback is going to be executed. We keep scrolling until it goes half out of view. Our callback is going to be executed again. So once you've created the observer, you need to give it a target element to actually watch. And whenever the target element meets the threshold that you specified for the intersection observer, the callback is going to be invoked. And the callback receives a list of intersection observer entry objects. So if we have a look at those, they look a bit like this. So we've got the bounding client rect, which is the result of calling get bounding client rect on the observed element. So it'll tell you the size of the element and its position relative to the viewport. Then the intersection ratio will tell us uh, the amount of the element that's currently visible. The intersection rectangle is the intersection of those two rectangles, so it's kind of like minusing one from the other. So if we were going to, for example, check whether an image should be in view and then load it, we would check the is intersecting entry, which will either be true or false and then load the image when it's true. Uh, root bounds is the result of calling get bounding client rect on our root element. And uh, I'm gonna show you what they look like here, hopefully. Can you, I guess you can't read this. Yeah. 
there we go. We get our console log of our intersection observer entry, and we can see our bounding client rect on the um, on the element. We've got our intersection ratio, so we can see how much of the element is in view. We've got our intersection rectangle. Um, is intersecting is true. Uh, these are all things that you might find useful when using this API. Um, so if we were going to lazy load our image, because we want the image to load smoothly, we can lay out each image on the page, give it the width and the height that it needs, but give it a very tiny source image. So maybe a, a one pixel image with a big gray background. We'll then start the loading of the correct images when they hit the intersection that we have decided that we want. So maybe you could use your margin to make it start loading a tiny bit before the image comes into the page, or you could have it hit, start loading exactly when it scrolls into view. Um, then once it's loaded, you will set the source of the image that is coming to view to be the correct URL. Um, use a bit of a blur animation so that you can't see what's happening when it's when you're swapping it over, and you get a really nice loading effect. So I don't know if you saw it. Okay. So those ones come in, and then as we scroll down, these ones start happening. Okay, my Wi-Fi is. Failing me. There we go. It's quite a nice effect. So hopefully you're all excited about Intersection Observer. You're ready to start using it in your projects and making your site super fast. But the first thing that we need to talk about obviously is support. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is actually slightly out of date. Um, look at what's actually going on there. You might have noticed that the Samsung internet one has gone from green to light green. Um, so we have no support in IE, we have no support in Safari, but uh, Chrome and Firefox and Edge have got it. Samsung internet. Um, for those of you who are interested in things like differences in browsers and specs, uh, the way that they implemented it is slightly different slash wrong to the way that <laughs> Chrome implemented it. Um, so we're back to light green support at the moment. Um, but you can use it. There is a polyfill. Um, so you can check whether intersection observer is on the window object and then load a polyfill instead. Um, and that's intersection observer. There are a few other things that we should talk about that I haven't mentioned. It's not pixel perfect. So I don't know if you noticed when I was scrolling down the Live Nation website, like a lot of the images didn't load. And when I was scrolling that little blue box, the percentage sometimes stuck at like maybe 98% when it was 100% in view. It's, it's not made to be perfect or very high latency. It's made to give you a sort of true or false and if you're using it to do things like scroll-dependent animations, that's not really going to work for you because the data is going to be out of date by the time you actually get to use it. And if you're doing lots of work in the callback that you give, it's still going to make your site slow. So uh, use it for things like um, lazy loading images. That's, it's really great for that. It's less great for really like scroll-dependent animations. Um, you may find yourself having to check different entries for different browsers. <coughs> Sounds like internet. Um, <laughs> so you might need to check things like is intersecting being true or false along with the intersection ratio being greater than zero, just to make sure that you cover all bases. <laughs> but wait for some more. Um, if you are interested in performance and you want tips on how to do more things like this, how to get more performance out of your website, I am running a conference in May in London. It is
is on the 10th and 11th of May, and our very own Saren is going to be speaking about accessibility and how it relates to performance, and the tickets are on sale, you should go check it out. Go forward and observe interactions. Thank you.